Hi, in this video you will learn how to create a remake of the old game Lemonade Stand from the year 1979. For this you will analyze the original source code and use Godot to transform it into a modern game development environment. You will also learn to write a disassembler in Godot which can help you understand machine language instructions used in the original source code. We chose Lemonade Stand for different reasons. From a technical perspective it has limited data, simple graphics and relatively simple logic. It shows how old ideas can be transformed in a modern wrapper and the whole process of going from an original source code up to writing tools like a disassembler to better understand it. We can also see how to structure code in a certain pattern which can be reused in other games. The gameplay elements of Lemonade Stand can be described as follows. The theme is that the player has a lemonade stand and is selling lemonade. The goal is to make the most money in the least amount of time. There are things the player sees, like how much money they have, things that can happen like different weather or random events like thunderstorms, and things the player can do like deciding how much to produce and what price to charge. The game can be divided in different stages. First, the weather is shown to the player. Then random events might happen and the player is informed about them. After that the player can make some decisions as in how much to produce. And then the business logic of the game calculates the result of the combination of the state and the player input. And finally the result gets shown. When you make a game you can consider different parts of a program structure. The data layer consisting of global and local data and how to initialize and when to reset the data. The logic layer which changes data based on the current state and player input. The view layer which gives a view on the data through text or images and allows for interaction through the logic layer. And the technical layer that is if your game runs in real time or event based. To see what the game is about we can look up some information on Wikipedia or play the original on an emulator. Here are some screenshots of the game. Download Godot, the export templates and shortly check out the link to the documentation. There does not seem to be a source for the original source code, so we head over to the emulator page and grab the original disk image. To extract files from the disk image we need special tools and in this case we use apple commander for which we need java to be installed. To edit the source code we can use Notepad++ which offers highlighting and good find and replace functions. Your download directory should look somewhat like this. We install Java and run the jar file for Apple Commander.
We open the disk image and extract the file called Lemonade. If you want, you can uninstall Java now. This is the original source code extracted. The original source code is written in one of many basic dialects. It helps the understanding if you have some general programming knowledge. Here are some common statements in the basic programming language. When you go through the source code, you might notice that it is a bit difficult to read. In the following steps, we will make it more readable so we can finally understand the important parts and transform them for our remake. These are the different steps we will take to beautify the source code. It looks like a lot and it is, but this is the step that is meant to take some time, so stop the video here and try to get a rough idea of the process. In general we try to find what could be functions, how conditional statements might execute and what variables could mean. Additionally we use some comments and apply some visual separation through empty lines. We make notes in places we understand. I will leave the following parts uncommented. They are the results of the different steps taken.
I did not make a flowchart for this video, but I found a tool that could help you if you want to make a flowchart. You ask why we use Godot. The simple answer is because. Other than that, there are many other reasons. Please pause the video and read through the points mentioned. If you want to get stuff done, just use Godot. By the way, if you want to build Godot and the offline documentation yourself, check out my other video. The following program is the result of an iterative process. First some parts of the program were written and later glued together to form a system. Sometimes a pen and the paper help to understand a problem and to solve it. Errors were made and the result is probably not the best solution. The point is to go easy on yourself, to get stuff done first and then to make it beautiful. Here's another reminder of the different parts of a program structure. We have data that doesn't do anything but represents a state. We have logic that does something with or depending on the data. And we have a few that shows data in some form and allows interaction through logic. I recommend you to skim over these three pages in the documentation to get an overview over the recommended coding style, file naming conventions and programming language elements. We can run Godot in self-contained mode by creating a file named like on the picture. Otherwise we just run Godot. We create a new project, give it a name. Click on create folder and click on create and edit. We have to set the project wide settings first, like the resolution of our window, how much we want to scale it up for a somewhat pixelated look and the mode of scaling, which in this case should be set to viewport. The sizes are based on traditional resolutions of 320 by 200 pixels and an additional 24 pixels for our input field. The whole game will only use one scene and one script. For our view layer we create a control node as a basic user interface node. We create a tween node which allows us to change node properties over time to achieve effects like a fadeout. A container is needed to align the elements in the following steps and a color rectangle is needed for the fadeout effect. We change how much of the area each node shall take and already set some properties like the color, in this case black transparent. The color rectangle does not need to be visible now. It will be made visible in the script later. We also disable the free space between the elements. Finally, we save the scene using lowercase letters for the file name. We add a texture rectangle node to represent an image and set a fixed size. We create a line edit node representing our input field with a blinking cursor. And we add another margin container which expands to the free space. To this container we add a color rectangle and set a color.
and we add another margin container which allows us to set the border for the child nodes. Finally, we add a rich text label node which represents our output and automatically scrolls to the end of the text. Then we center our design area and run the scene, which we have to set on the first run. This is a short overview over the functions we will be creating. In the ready function we initialize some state like setting the title image. Set state allows us to change the state. Set state deferred is called by set state on the end of the frame because we should not change the state while the frame is being processed. State enter does something depending on the state which was just set. Handle substate is used if a state has some steps inside. Set text unroll gives a nice effect of gradually showing more and more text. There are two helper functions. Append text appends text to the output and set image sets the image. Finally, there's a callback function for when the user entered something in the line edit node. We attach a new script to the top node. Then we get all the references to the few layer nodes and to the tween node as variables. We initialize the random number generator so that it returns different numbers every time the game is run. We also want to set the text input field to be focused so that it can receive keyboard input. From the line edit node we connect the text entered signal to a callback function in the script. As an example we just clear the input field when pressing enter. We need to create a directory called assets in our project directory and we create five images of size 320 by 200 pixels with these file names. We create an enumeration for the weather. We took the values from the original source code and we create a constant dictionary where the key is the weather enumeration or zero and which maps to the path of the assets we created. We create a helper function which allows us to set the image and we set the image to the title image in the ready function. We create an enumeration for some of the states we have and which we will extend in the following steps. We also create a variable holding the current state, initializing it to a default value. Now we create three functions. One is called when a new state is set, another is called by that set state function after the frame is processed, and another one which is called when the state is entered for the first time. For debugging purposes, we print out the state that has been set. And we finally set the first state in the ready function.
We create a match statement in the state enter and the input function for each of the states with a stub which we will extend later. For easier string comparisons, we transform the input to lowercase. Certain inputs we want to be handled independent of the current state. For example, we want to be able to quit the game in every state. Now we create the quit state. First we print a message. Then we make the overlay which is used for the fade effect visible. We use the tween to modify the alpha part of the color property of the color rect node over the duration of one second starting after two seconds. And we want to be informed when that process is done. Therefore we connect the completed signal of the tween to the quit function of the scene tree object. Always consult the inline or external documentation using some combinations of shift and f1, alt and f1 or control and click. We create a little text effect and change the text output part in the quit state accordingly. When testing for bugs we can see that our program allows us to run the quit state part multiple times, which looks like we cancel the quit process just to start a new one. To prevent it, we can discard the input in the input function for cases we know. We will extend on that part later. We extend the enumeration for state with the restart state and create stubs in the state enter and the input function. When we are in the start state, we want to display a greeting message and change the state independent of any input just by a timer. Here we use a one-shot timer's timeout signal and connect that to our setState function with the argument being the restart state. We extend the state enumeration by a state which gives the player the option to restart or quit. We output the question in the state enter function and create a helper function that depends to the output. Then we handle the input in the input function and set the state accordingly. Or we tell the player what we think of them if the input validation fails. By observation we found another case where we want to discard the input and that is if the output text is unrolled and not fully shown yet. We test our new state by setting it in the ready function. After the test we set our starting state to start again. We also fix the quit command by appending a return statement to leave the function early so the input is not handled in state specific parts. We also extend the global commands by a restart command which sets the state to restart. We are now at the point where we can create the variables we need for the game. After we looked at the original source code we came up with these variables. There are global variables like day or thunderstorm and there are player variables like money. And some variables have to be reset on a restart, like day and money, and some have to be reset each round, like thunderstorm. And some variables are set and used in different states. There are also constants, which in this case make sense for the price of signs, which doesn't change, and other constants which could be replaced by their value. The original author might have used variables to tweak the outcome, so we keep them. We now implement the restart state. 
We reset the global and player variables that need to be reset when a new game starts. We also output some instructions for the game. We now add four additional states to the state enumeration and implement stops in the state enter and input function. We then implement the weather report state, which represents a new day. We start by resetting the variables that have to be reset on a new day. We create a string variable, which we will append to multiple strings and which we output at the end. We increase the day variable and we set the weather variable depending on a random number. We set the image to the weather texture and we check if we have to increase the cost of lemonade. On each step we append relevant information to the output string. And finally we set the weather report state when we press enter on the restart state. On the first two days there are no random events, so the state changes directly to the decision state. Later the next state will always be the random event state. We implement the random event state. On a cloudy day there is a rain chance changing the modifier variable randomly. On a hot and dry day the modifier is doubled. On a sunny day there is a chance for the street department event, which randomly either results in a 0.1 modifier or that all glasses will be sold at any price. From the random event state we switch to the decision state. We implement a bit of the decision state. In the decision state the player is asked multiple questions which can repeat, but we only want to show the balance on the state enter function. We now need a state in a state called substate which we create a variable for. We create the substate function which is just used for the decision state substate and implement a stub. Then we change the part in the state enter function where we reset the substate and call the handle substate function. Finally we implement a stub in the input function. This is also structured to handle the substates. The substate is presenting questions to the player. And to test it we change the initial state to the decision state. In the input function we implement what is going to happen in the first substate. We check the input for a valid integer and we check if it is in a certain range and we check if the player has enough money. If any check fails, the player is presented with an error message. Otherwise the substate changes to the next step. We implement the other two questions and we also implement the question if the player wants to repeat the input. We change the initial state to start. We first implement the resolve state part in the input function. If the player is bankrupt they will be asked to restart the game, otherwise a new day will begin. Now we start implementing the resolve state in the state enter function. We create a string which we will append to and output at the end. We append certain information like random events that happened. We then implement the part where the final result is calculated. 
In the two clear cases of the street department buying everything and the thunderstorm, we know how many glasses will be sold. Otherwise, there are two cases, one for if the price is above the constant, which is 10 cents here, and another if it is below. In those cases, the influence of the signs will be calculated. The potential sales, which could be more than the glasses the player made, are stored in the glasses sold variable, which is finally clamped to how many glasses the player made. To let the player know about the success of their business decisions, we calculate the income, the expenses and the profit. The profit is then added to the player money variable. We also append to the string what we want the player to be informed about. In case the player is bankrupt, we let them know. We can now test our final game and be proud of ourselves. This is the full source code in case you missed the part. To export the game, we need to have the export templates installed. Here we export the game to Windows. We append all files and we want to make it a release version. Our game will be in just one executable file then. Here are some more ideas which you can implement if you want to. From the source code you might remember the poke statements. They filled the memory with machine language for the 6502 CPU which was used in the Apple II. 
we are going to write a little disassembler. We can use the output to better understand the subroutines used, which in this case were for sound generation and graphics effects. If you are curious, you can play with the Apple II emulator, even run the game or try yourself in some assembler language experiments. We want to go from this part of the source code to this output of the disassembler. We begin by creating the view layer, the graphical user interface. For the script we will be using these functions. First we convert the string from the source code to a representation of the memory locations and their values. Then we want to disassemble that memory. We disassemble instruction by instruction and for jump instructions we create a helper function that calculates the target location. The callback function is used when the disassemble button is pressed. We center our design area, attach our script and start getting references to the few elements. For the pressed signal on the button, we just copy the content for now. We insert our example code in the text edit node through the inspector, so we don't have to paste it every time the program is run again. Later we should remove this. In the following steps we extract memory locations and values from the input string. There isn't any error checking going on. It is assumed that after a poke string there will be two integers. Each single integer will be appended to a string, one for the memory location, another for the value. Then those strings are converted to integers and put in a dictionary which represents the memory. The disassemble function has three parts. From the dictionary we sort all keys, which are the memory locations. Then we find consecutive memory locations and remember locations starting a new block. After that we go through each block and disassemble the first instruction. We use the return value to find the next address and stop if that doesn't exist. In the loop the next block will be handled then. 
the disassemble instruction function here is just a stub. We changed the button callback function and extended the stub and the disassemble instruction function. The assert is just for the development process which stops the program if the variable for the bytes used isn't set. In the disassemble instruction function we get access to up to 3 bytes making up an instruction and create variables for the hexadecimal representation. We create a default case for instructions we don't know and consume one byte and we improve our output string to have a certain format. Up until now the result looks something like this. We start at the first 3 bytes. We then look up the value of the first byte in the reference we use. Here we can find that this opcode is for the LDA instruction taking 3 bytes in total. After that we implement the instruction. We are interested in the opcode, the mnemonic and we always have to set the bytes used. This is what it looks like. In some reference manuals you can find the address C030 is related to the speaker. Now we create a helper function for calculating target locations in forward and backward jumps. We also want existing comments to be prepended with a semicolon. Every time we add a new instruction we run the program and implement the next one. Here we implemented jumps using the calculate target location helper function. For this instruction we added a special comment which describes the system subroutine called. In some reference manuals you can find information about those. This here is the final result of the disassembler. Remember we only implemented the instructions we needed to disassemble our provided code. If you want to use a monospace font you can change that here. When we change the code to disassemble, we want everything to be reset. Here is the full source code of the disassembler. Finally, here is a summary of what we have learned in this video and the different processes we went through. Making this video took quite some time, so I really hope you found it useful. You can pause the video if you want to read it. That's it. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something and if you did, please like the video and consider subscribing to the channel if you want to support the creation of future content. Bye.